Hello, everybody. I'm Ryan Tucker, the Advanced Emergency Medicine Ultrasound Fellowship Director and Faculty in the Department of Emergency Medicine. Today, we're going to be talking about the COVID-19 pandemic and the use of lung ultrasound in these patients. We're going to use the COVID-19 pandemic as a, a test case and how we use imaging on the front lines to diagnose and treat these patients. I have no disclosures. First, I don't have to tell you this is an extraordinary time to be in medicine. Thank you for all you're doing to flatten the curve. Our understanding of the COVID-19 pandemic is very fluid, but we know that social distancing uh, measures do work. Please continue to do this and encourage everyone you know to protect themselves and to protect healthcare workers. You are experts, medical experts, and so uh, what you say can be impactful. This pandemic has brought up important issues with regard to disaster preparedness, epidemiology, public health, and bioethics. All of these aspects of medicine have been brought to the forefront. Since I'm a clinician, I will focus on how we're treating these patients in the ED and the EDICU. Here are the goals for this talk. We're going to describe the rationale for using different imaging modalities including lung ultrasound in patients with suspected COVID-19 infection. We're going to describe the general approach to performing lung ultrasound. We're going to identify the abnormal findings on lung ultrasound and how they compare to different disease uh, states. We're going to describe the general disinfection process for the ultrasound machine and the extra steps that we're uh, taking uh, to ensure provider safety. Let's use an example patient case. The details of this case uh, have been changed to protect the anonymity of the patient. We have a 70s year old male with a history of hypertension who presents with cough, fever, and shortness of breath. Initial vital signs, the patient is febrile with a temperature of 38.1. Heart rate shows tachycardia of the heart rate of 129. The patient's blood pressure is 95 over 54. And the oxygen saturation is 70% on a non-rebreather. So before entering the room, you uh, place your personal protective equipment on, or PPE. This includes uh, a gown, double gloves, as well as a cap, goggles, and face protection. On the left, this is a N95 mask. For those who can't achieve an adequate seal with the N95 mask, you have your PAPR unit that's here on the right. All patients in the emergency department who are undergoing investigation for COVID-19 infection have a yellow tag on the door, which is our special uh, pathogens tag. So you evaluate this patient, you perform a physical exam, you order lab tests, including a COVID-19 PCR test, and you think about what kind of imaging test you want to order in the evaluation of this patient. So we decided to start with a chest x-ray for this patient. We know from case reports and case series from China that chest x-ray, especially early in the patient's COVID-19 course, will often not show signs of infection. We'll often see this x-ray here on the left where we have very clear, normal-looking lung fields. We know that chest x-ray has far from perfect sensitivity for detecting pneumonia, most notably bacterial pneumonia. This x-ray on the right shows very advanced COVID-19 viral pneumonia and ARDS. A full discussion of ARDS is outside the scope of this lecture. However, this stands for acute respiratory distress syndrome, and it's an advanced adverse inflammatory condition in the lung that happens in response to stress, and this causes protonaceous alveolar deposits within the alveoli, which results in severe hypoxia as well as poor lung compliance. And this can happen in response to any type of stress, uh, including uh, viral pneumonia, and this is a very common finding in the sickest COVID-19 patients. Another imaging choice for these patients is chest CT. 
These are chest CT images from a patient, uh, actually two different patients in China with confirmed COVID-19 infection. On the left, a patient with mild symptoms has ground glass opacities in the right upper lung field, as seen here. On the right, a patient with more severe uh, symptoms has more advanced CT findings. You see these subpleural consolidations. This is the outer lining of the pleura, and they're just deep to that. And they're bilateral posterior in this patient. You have this bright line here, which is a air-filled um, airway structure uh, within a larger area of consolidated lung. This is an uh, air bronchogram. In this patient, we see a dense consolidation in the right posterior lung with many air bronchograms that you can see here. So chest CT is very sensitive for detecting pneumonia. However, these findings are not specific to COVID-19 infection and could be present in other uh, viral pneumonias. At least in early studies out of China, CT was suggested as a gold standard diagnostic uh, imaging test for COVID-19. The downside of using CT for diagnosis are the risks associated with it. Transporting the patient to the CT scanner takes them out of an isolated room. This potentially places other patients as well as healthcare workers at risk. In addition, the decontamination process for the scanner itself may take up to an hour or more. So what if a sick trauma patient comes in and the CT scanner is being decontaminated and it's unavailable? This could adversely impact the care uh, provided overall in the emergency department. So use of point of care ultrasound or POCUS is an attractive alternative to CT. It may be more sensitive for detecting COVID-19 pneumonia than X-ray. However, it is not as sensitive as CT. With ultrasound, however, all of the imaging can be done at the bedside, and so the patient does not need to be transported. There are two main types of ultrasound machines available on the market. On the left is a cart-based system, and these have been around for decades. You have a laptop unit on top of a, a cart with wheels, and the uh, probes plug into the laptop unit and are attached to the side here. A newer version of uh, ultrasound is handheld ultrasound. This on the right is a, a butterfly, which is a very popular machine right now. This condenses all this equipment into this handheld device. This plugs into either an iPhone or an iPad. The butterfly is being used in many emergency departments uh, around the world right now uh, on these patients. The advantage is that it's small, can fit uh, inside a sterile probe cover, and is very easy to decontaminate. Let's talk a little bit about how ultrasound works. The transducer or probe emits sound waves. These bounce off structures in the body and return to the transducer. The brightness that the transducer detects is proportional to the strength of the signal that comes back from the tissue. Different tissues have different echogenicities, and that's how we tell them apart on ultrasound. This is an ultrasound image that is being done of a hip joint. We see here this dark area, which is simple fluid that's termed anechoic. Just deep to that, we see a bright interface with shadowing underneath. So none, no sound gets through, and that's the typical appearance of bone, which is very echo dense. See that here? More superficially, we see muscle tissue here, and there's areas of dark as well as bright areas here. It's a striated appearance typical of muscle. Since it has different echogenesis, it's called heterochoic. There's two more muscle bellies superficial, so there's here and here, separated by a fascial plane, which is this hyperechoic line here. These two muscle bellies have very similar appearance on ultrasound, so those are termed isoechoic. There are many types of probes or transducers. The most common three types we see here. On the left, this is your linear probe. It's uh, flat here. This is a high frequency probe that's best used for superficial structures because it has 
high frequency. These structures have very high resolution. And this is the probe of choice for any ultrasound guided uh, procedure that uses needles, including central lines and nerve blocks. In the middle, here's your curvilinear probe. So it's curved on the top, as you can see. This is lower frequency, which allows greater penetration into deep tissues. So this is a common probe used for abdominal imaging. Uh, the FAST exam would be an example. On the right, this is the cardiac probe. This is a low to mid frequency transducer. The footprint is very small, as you can see here. So it's easy to fit in between the ribs when you're doing an echocardiogram, which is the primary use of the cardiac probe. A word uh, quickly on the conventions. So each probe will have a probe marker. You can see that here. The convention is that uh, when you're imaging up and down with a probe up and down, that probe marker should be pointed towards the head. If you're imaging with the probe across the patient like this, that probe marker should be pointed to the patient's right. The reason this is useful is it allows you to orient yourself on the patient. In this image here, we're using the curvilinear probe to image in the abdomen. You see the vertebrae, which is this bright hyperechoic line here. It's so your aorta, which is this tube-like structure you're seeing in the short axis, and then the IVC here. The probe marker will be present on the screen as well. So it's this green dot here. So the green dot um, is towards the left side of the screen. And if your probe marker is pointed to the right side of the patient, that indicates the right side of the patient, which makes sense because your IVC should be on the right side of the patient relative to the aorta, which should be more towards the left. This is the keyboard of one of the ultrasound machines that we use in the emergency department. The number of buttons, dials, and slides can be kind of intimidating, but the good news is that for 90% of the things that you're going to need to do, you really only need a few buttons. Uh, two of the important ones are labeled here. So this dial, labeled in red, here is your gain, and this uh, button here is your depth. Let's talk a little bit about depth. So depth is how deep that you're telling the ultrasound to send the sound waves. There'll be a ruler on the right side of the screen here that tells you how deep that you're looking with the ultrasound. Here you're looking 16.2 centimeters deep, so pretty deep. In this scan, we're doing a fast exam. This is the spleen, and this is the kidney here. And what this line is showing is that we're using this depth here that we don't really need. We could decrease our depth and put the bottom of the screen here. That would make the structures we're looking at uh, much larger and allow us uh, for better visualization of those structures. Let's talk about gain. You can think about gain as the volume control button on your ultrasound machine. What it does is it tells the machine how to amplify the signal that's coming back from the tissues in the patient. This ultrasound image here is an echocardiogram. Just to go through the structure as quickly, you have your right ventricle here, left ventricle here, left atrium, and this is your aortic outflow tract. You have your mitral valve that's opening and closing. You can see that here. It's your aortic valve opening and closing here. This is your descending thoracic aorta, the circular structure here. And so this is a good example of ideal gain. So you have the blood that's in the heart is anechoic, very dark. Your valves, you can see here, are very bright. So you have the maximum contrast in between the dark and light structures. So when you're doing an ultrasound exam, you can play with the uh, gain and try to figure out which gain uh, gives you the best uh, contrasted image. For long ultrasound, the curvilinear and linear probes are the most useful. This curvilinear probe here is useful to look at the lung parenchyma and uh, deep into the lung, given its low frequency. The linear probe is most useful if you're concerned primarily uh, at the pleura and the subpleural 
um, structures and will give you higher resolution of the superficial structures uh, if that's what you need. In the emergency department, we've been using a six zone lung scanning protocol. There are many different published approaches um, for how many lung fields to use per lung, up to 24 per lung. We've chosen a six zone protocol to limit exposure and the time to scan uh, each patient. You have two anterior lung fields. So R1 is your upper anterior field. R2 is your lower anterior lung field. Moving lateral, R3 is your upper lateral lung field. R4 is your lower lateral lung field. These are your posterior fields. R5 is the upper posterior and R6 is the lower posterior lung field. We use a lawnmower technique scanning through each of these areas looking for abnormalities. To get R5 and R6 lung fields, you'll have to reposition the patient either sitting up or laying on the side. Some patients may be too critically ill to be able to reposition and get these uh, windows. If you place the probe with a marker facing the patient's head, you should get two rib shadows. This is here, this bright hyperchoic line, everything shadows underneath, same here. So these are your two ribs on either side. In between, you'll get a window into the lung field here. This is the skin, subcutaneous fat, and muscle layers here. This bright white line is your visceral pleura of the lung. Everything deep to that in a normal lung is mostly air. And so what you're imaging down here is not a real structure, but is artifact. These horizontal lines you'll see here and here are A lines, and those are normal uh, lung signature. And that's thought to be the ultrasound waves reflecting off of the septa within the lung and causing that artifact. This is a highlighted version of that short clip. So we have our parietal pleura in the green, visceral pleura in the red, and these blue lines here are outlining those A lines, the horizontal lines, which are indicative of normal aerated lung tissue. The best way I can summarize lung ultrasound findings in patients with COVID-19 is chaos. You can see all the different examples of lung pathology in all different places. These are actually very good patients for teaching purposes because of the amount and the diversity of pathologic lung findings you see on their ultrasound exams. There is no one pathognomonic lung ultrasound finding for COVID-19 viral pneumonia that's specific to the disease. However, there are a few very common findings that uh, correlate closely with CT findings in these patients. In a study of 20 Chinese non-critically ill patients with proven COVID-19 infection, B lines, consolidations, both subpleural and larger, deeper consolidations, as well as air bronchograms were common findings. Pleural fusions were found to be uncommon. So let's talk about what each of these pathologies look like on lung ultrasound. Let's go back to our case. So our 70s year old male with history of hypertension who presented with cough, fever, and shortness of breath. I'll remind you of his uh, concerning vital signs there. So we've donned all our PPE. We've placed sterile probe covers on the probes and now we're scanning this patient. This is L1, so this is the left lung, the anterior upper lung field. Just to reorient to you here, we have hyperechoic line here with shadowing underneath. So those are your rib shadows. Everything in between you're seeing is lung tissue. At the beginning of this clip, what we see is this area here, which is a heterochoic dark with bright lines in between. That is a subpleural consolidation, an area of consolidated lung just deep to the pleura. At the end of the clip, we see these bright spotlights coming down. They start at the pleura and they go all the way to the bottom of the screen. Those are examples of B lines. Both of those lung findings suggest some material filling the alveoli, whether that be blood, whether that be fluid in the case of pulmonary edema, or in this case, a patient with COVID-19 infection, 
its inflammatory material on pus. So this is the same lung field, 1L, which is our anterior upper lung field on the left side. What we've done here is we decreased the depth. So we went from a depth of anywhere from 16 to 18 uh, down to a uh, shallow depth. And what we're doing here is we're seeing subcutaneous tissues here, muscle layers, the pleural line is here, and we are zooming in on this consolidation. So this is a very typical subpleural consolidation. You have anechoic areas in here with bright hyperechoic areas within it. And you see this irregular border. So here, you see this border coming down. So that's where consolidated lung meets more aerated lung. This is called the shred sign because the border looks shredded. Okay, so we've moved ahead a little bit. Now we're in L5. So this is the left lung field, posterior lung field, but upper lung field. And again, we're seeing some subpleural consolidation. <clears throat> These are larger and deeper consolidations here. At the beginning of the clip, you see some uh, B lines towards the head there. And then you see these consolidated lung areas here. We're not seeing any of those horizontal A lines. So we have abnormal lung tissue here. All right, so R1, this is our right lung, the anterior upper field. This clip is interesting because we're seeing some normal and abnormal lung findings. On the left side of the screen here, at the beginning of the clip, we see those horizontal A-lines. So that's a normal aerated lung. <clears throat> More towards the feet, what we're seeing is again, the subpleural consolidation here. And then we see these bright white lines coming down. So those are B-lines. Early, less severe B-lines are pretty narrow. Um, when there are enough B-lines, they become uh, convalescent B-lines. So a lot of them stuck together and they become very thick. This is another <clears throat> clip of the right anterior upper lung field. Again, we see some areas of these horizontal A-lines look very normal. And as we scan through, towards the end of the clip, we see those spotlights coming down, those B-lines. All right, so we move down on the chest. Now we're in the inferior lung field. We see the pleural line again here. We see another subpleural consolidation, all of this here that heterochoic area here, all that consolidated lung. <clears throat> Surrounding it, we're seeing some of those B lines there. Now we're in R3. So we're in the lateral right side of lung fields, the upper portion. And again, we're seeing some of the more of those subpolar consolidations, see the one in that lung field as well as this lung field. All right, so R4, so now we're lateral, but we're more towards the diaphragm. We're seeing lots of B-lines. See those spotlights coming down at the beginning of the clip here, here. These on the right, there's so many of them that they're those convalescent B-lines. So it looks like one big spotlight coming down. Okay, R6, so now we're the posterior lung field on the right, and we're down towards the diaphragm. And we see a very large consolidation here. So. All of this tissue here is uh, all consolidated. We see that irregular border here, the shred sign, or we're seeing consolidated lung and some more aerated lung uh, more towards the head. This is not from a COVID-19 patient, but I think it's a, a good example of an important pathology here we're imaging lateral on the patient towards the diaphragm. This is the diaphragm here actually. So everything to the right is in the abdomen. This is the pleural line up here. <clears throat> All of this lung just above the diaphragm is consolidated. This is called hepatization. So this lung looks like liver tissue because it's so solid. We're seeing again this irregular border where that consolidated lung meets aerated lung, the shred sign here. We're seeing a couple different types of air bronchograms. <clears throat> so this bright line here is a static air bronchogram. There's a couple here, meaning that 
this is air within the airways of that consolidated lung. It doesn't move when the patient breathes, so those are static air bronchograms. The most important finding here is you see this white dot, which is moving up and down <clears throat> when the patient breathes. Those are called dynamic air bronchograms. That's an important finding because that finding is very specific to pneumonia. You can see then you can see static air bronchograms in atelectasis or pneumonia, but having that moving dynamic air bronchogram that moves when the patient breathes is very, very suggestive of pneumonia. So we've seen all of these findings. We've seen B-lines, both simple and convalescent B-lines. We've seen consolidations subpleural consolidations as well as deeper and larger consolidations, and we've seen examples of both dynamic and static air bronchograms. There's no finding in particular that's a signature of appearance of COVID-19 infection. All of these findings could be found in atypical bacterial infections as well as different uh, viral pneumonias. We need more data to determine uh, which findings are more suggestive of COVID-19 infection and which findings can risk stratify the patient, meaning which findings can determine which patients would do poorly. Fortunately, there's many people out there, including our own ultrasound group, that are researching those questions. Okay, so you've now completed the scan and you're ready to clean the machine. We've created a machine decontamination process. So as we talked about before, you'll have your gown, all your headgear, and double gloves. The first step is to remove your outer gloves and use alcohol-based solution to clean those gloves. You then grab an Oxivir wipe, which uh, come in these uh, buckets here, and you wipe down the machine top to bottom. Then you go through the doffing process to remove all your personal protective equipment. You're now outside of the room. You do a second cleaning step where you wipe down the machine top to bottom a second time. As you can imagine, there's a lot of surface area on this machine, so it takes a while. This is an advantage of the handheld machines, which are much quicker to decontaminate. So now you're ready to document your ultrasound finding and move on to your next patient. Thank you very much for your attention to this lecture. I don't think uh, I've ever been more proud of my specialty of emergency medicine as we're on the front lines fighting this uh, pandemic. Our faculty, our residents, our hospital are working around the clock to manage this crisis and ensure that we take great care of these patients. Feel free to email me any questions. This is my email address here. This is my Twitter handle down here as well. You can tweet at me if you'd like. Thank you again for listening to this talk and be safe.